That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Captive Audience, a real American horror story, uh, which is a three episode series uh, premiering on Hulu uh, April 21st, 2022, directed by documentarian Jessica Dimmock. <laughs> I'm thinking about one of the people featured in the docuseries uh, who is like the ex wife of Stephen Stainer, or the widowed wife of Stephen Stainer. Mm -hmm. As soon as you saw her, you. <laughs> You mimicked uh, Ursula the Sea Witch. <laughs> and then we were kept giggling every time we saw And then every, yeah. Because what did I say? Oh, the men up here don't like a lot of blather. <laughs> That's so rude. Okay, anyway. <laughs> uh, Jessica Dimmick has uh, previously directed <laughs> the docuseries Flint Town, which from its title I feel like you should know what that's about. And Flint, uh, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Undrinkable water. In the police force there, and uh, that from 2018. And her first documentary was uh, she co-directed called The Pearl, which was about uh, a group, uh, several different individuals that were senior citizens becoming uh, trans. Okay, this docu series, three parts, uh, focuses on the Stainer family. And for those who don't remember Stephen Stainer. This family is mom, dad, and five kids. And Stephen Stainer, uh, in 1972, mm -hmm. was abducted and then returned home seven years later. And it was a very popular sort of thing when it happened, but then it became part of the zeitgeist in 1989 when there was a TV movie made called I Know My First Name is Stephen. That was, and that I'm very familiar with that case. I remember watching the two-part series uh or event with my mom and talking about abduction and people touching me in places they shouldn't and, and all that so i'm very familiar with this so it's about that it's very straightforward like he was kidnapped by some man who was like a pedophile and this boy was abused and then he was able to escape one day with another boy who the man a, a young boy the man had just so he was kidnapped at the age of seven and returned at 14 but at 14 the guy who kidnapped him had kidnapped another little boy. So Stephen absconded with the boy to safety and was reunited with his family. And unfortunately, at the age of 24, was involved in a very bad car accident while driving a motorcycle and was killed. Notably, the night before the Emmys. Yeah, because the, the, the TV series was nominated for like four Emmys or yeah. something. Okay, but the way this docuseries sets it up is like, like the tagline is like um, Stephen Story, and then Stephen Story's Part Two. No, but I mean they say like the the, the house of the the horrors of hor the American horror story, a real American horror story. So the, what they're talking about is so this thing happened to Stephen. Well, Stephen had an older brother named Carrie, mm -hmm. and we find out that many years later, a decade later, the older brother killed four women at Yosemite National Park. And it's very straightforward because he killed these women in short succession and then admitted to it. Well, he wasn't, you know, very discreet. So he was convicted. The end. Okay. And is currently uh, sitting on death row. Then, so three episodes. I have like no notes because I'm very familiar with the abduction case. And the older brother is... Like, it's so straightforward. There's no... I mean, if it were a Dayline episode, it'd be 10 minutes because it's just... He he was very sloppy. He just did it. He wanted to get caught. When they caught his ass, he said, yeah, I did it. Took him to where he did it. And then the court trial was like, boom, boom, pow. So, the first two episodes are about Steven and the abduction. And then the last episode is about his brother. Uh, I The only notes I have are that we do have the two actors who played Stephen and Carrie in the TV movie are present because we have audio tape that the man who wrote the TV movie recorded. The screenwriter. Of himself, the producer, the director, and Stephen talking about how they want to approach the TV film. So there's kind of a lot going on and it doesn't really connect well for me because... I feel like this is trying, you know, an American horror story is trying to connect these two sort of terrible things. And like, there, there's no correlation, really. And if they're trying to imply there is, because they do try to say that Carrie was jealous of all the attention his brother got when he returned. And then we see that the first person to visit Carrie in prison was a journalist. And the first thing Carrie said was, I need you to make sure this gets made into a TV movie. 
So I feel like I don't know what they're trying to do with that, but um, we also get Stephen's children. He had two children, a, a, do a son and a daughter. And that's unfortunate because they were quite young when their dad died. Mm -hmm. So they don't really know much about their dad. So a lot of what they're saying is kind of like how they feel about the idea of their dad after watching the movie, which I thought was sad to think like my the entire impression of my dad would be like a two-part TV movie. And how the daughter, Ashley, uh, when she would see the actor, who's still prominent, especially in a lot of Lifetime television series. Corin Nemec. How yeah. she would... Who was also... Uh, Parker Lewis and Parker Lewis can't lose. That's probably how people knew him. But anyway, uh, how she gets emotional seeing him like she wants to hug him because to her, that's her dad. I, I just think the more I think about it, this docuseries lacking because I almost wish they would have tried to connect. I mean, maybe they did and Corin Nemec was like, under no circumstances am I meeting this man's daughter. But it, it just feels like they're taking a lot of facts and like people's because his family, we get Stephen and Corey Carrie's mom and sister in the thing. Mm -hmm. And the mom seems very aloof about talking about Steven. Like she opens up by saying, I've talked about this so much. I don't know why you need me to repeat myself. So she seems a little disgruntled and kind of a wreck. And then when it comes to her murderous son, Carrie, she's like, I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, why do we even have her in the thing? Then the other sister who seems like maybe she's, had some issues. She's of no help. Well, she was really young when her brother was abducted as well. So, so it's like, she's not of no help. The children are of no help. I, I and, and then we get a lot of people who went to school with Stephen when he was... Um, Dennis. Dennis, because that's what the man who abducted him named him. And those people are just trying real hard to recount stories of this person from 30 plus years ago. Well, and a teacher who got emotional. And a teacher. Like wishing, you know, when you wish you had known more that something terrible was happening and you would have intervened if you'd known. And I, I think that I get the sense that this is looking to fill in some like human, I don't want to say human holes. It's like a human component. Uh, fill in some human holes. Here, because I thought it was really interesting listening to the screenwriters uh, converse, like had copious notes about this for this television film, like took his job very seriously. But again, this is the, back in the day when these things were also kind of respected right. because people, but tuned in, tuned in, but also his notes on how he didn't want to do this with characters, but he knew that he had to fake this or do that because the network, the, the, uh, this formula demanded it. You know, I think what would have made a better piece is focus on the screenwriter's recordings and his approach to writing this very popular TV film because he took it very seriously. He wanted to respect a lot of things. He had to make concessions because it is, you know, something we have to market. I think that was way more fascinating than hearing family members who seem fatigued talking about this thing and they really have no information. They don't, I mean, they didn't know anything. No, but marked irreparably by this, right? Sure, but I, I feel that felt exploitative, like watching these people who are like, I don't really know. It didn't feel exploitative to me because the the very end of the third episode is where I thought I got the sense of what this was supposed to be, where the documentarian was thanking them for their time and just kind of, and, and kind of saying how nice it was to hear the, their perspective and their angle, which was... Polite. Pol I don't know that I think it... I mean, I don't know what the purpose is. It, it didn't illuminate anything. I, I, I think it just took two sensational things that happened to one family. Yeah, I, I think I guess I wish there was a wrap-up of... Is this about the media and how they kind of really hindered this family being able to heal at all? Right. Uh, and it, it sounds like Carrie had some mental health issues that predated his brother being uh, abducted, abducted that... that this occluded because the the father Delbert did not want Stephen to see a therapist at all either, and it's like, well, you got this other kid that really needs one too. Um, I was more interested in the third uh, episode by Michael Kroll, who is the mitigation specialist, the one who had to gather all the data that he could about Carrie for the trial to kind of explain, because they were trying to say that he was uh, guilty by insanity as well, which the jury didn't buy. Um, and how he had noticed a lot of weird, troubling, not weird, troubling, repeated uh, issues in the family, including sexual abuse. And it's like, oh, I much rather would have heard 
what he discovered about this family and how that played out. Right. I think that's why I feel like it just feels so like, what is the point? Because there's a huge span of time and of um, experience with this family that we don't know anything about. And if you're trying to correlate these two things, then what you just said, we need to understand like that there is a history of abuse and other things in this family. And, you know, because then the question about Stephen was like, why did you stay so long when you had all these opportunities to leave? Because Stephen had many opportunities to leave. He went to school. He actually did walk out of the house a few times and then realized he didn't know where to go. So it's like, well, maybe Stephen, it wasn't hard to convince this little boy to not go home because home life was terrible. You know, let the mom tell it. She's like, well, the way they depicted our family is not how it really was. We weren't poor and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, well, something's going on. Because your little kid got abducted in plain, like, and was out in plain sight and stayed gone for seven years. And then your oldest kid went and mur murdered four people and then just told on his himself. So clearly there are other things happening that they don't want to talk about. So it was unsatisfying, but in that weird way of like, I'm unsatisfied by a meal that I don't even need to eat. I'm not trying to consume other people's trauma. It's fascinating, but it's also like, I don't know. It just feels like it's old. Like, it's old. We already know about it. It's not like this cold case that got solved and like sure. no one knew about it. Sure. Like, we're all, I, I'm very aware about Steven Stainer. I didn't need to watch two more episodes. I wasn't. Uh, you weren't. So then what did you think about that? I wasn't, I mean, it, it's just, it's compelling that, you know, one, this child came back and then the, the ripple effects, the ripple effects of everything, you, you know, uh, it, to this family and this, this boy's uh, psychological trauma growing up. And, he, you know, he was a heavy drinker. He was clearly trying to escape. And then all of a sudden settled down at the age of 19 with a 16 year old, had two kids. There's a movie made about him in which he appears in. And then he just dies. Like there, it just like, everything seems so compounded that I think that's what's fascinating. And, and, and what you want to know is like, well, how did these people deal with it? You know, what also could have been a better piece is, you know, um, we made a review for the most beautiful boy in the world, uh, -huh. uh which is well hated, but, the is it hated well i have to turn the comments off uh and the view duration is very short oh which means like once they start hearing me and my bullshit they turn it off but anyway i think what would have been more fascinating is what you just described like this terrible thing happens to this person and then a movie is made about their life it becomes super popular and then how does that affect them because the person died shortly after it was released but just sort of everything, like what that means and everything surrounding it, that could have been more interesting. Well, it's just, uh, the, the, this kid comes back after seven years and the media is following him to school and asking, you know, that's an awkward period anyway. But And, and then it's public knowledge that he'd been molested. And what when, when can he have a reprieve? Is the that what press notes like? for this made it seem like whatever they were about to tell us was going to be like a gag. And I was hoping for... What is the movie we watched? We reviewed it. And it's like a low budget indie film with an older actress as like the bad guy. And then in the middle of the interview, you tell me that that lady was featured oh. in a documentary about her being abducted by aliens. It wasn't it's a, the one word. It's a very generic title. It's some horror film. I'm going to, I'm going to post the review we did. You need to watch it because when you find out what the gag is, like my reaction is what I was hoping I would get from this. Cause that's how they're selling it. Sure. But it's very matter of fact, like this boy was kidnapped. His brother killed four people. What does it mean? Like, you tell me. I don't know. I mean, there are enough creepy things that are worth a conversation about for sure. It's just, you know, the, the amount of trauma this family's gone through and then still aren't really able to open up enough to where it would help us understand anything at all. It makes it seem a little pointless. But mm -hmm. but it's still it's still interesting. And what, at the end of the day, it made me want to watch I Know My First Name is Steven because I haven't seen that. Because I was like five when that came out. Um, if you don't know anything about Steven Stainer, I think you would be more intrigued by it. If you do, I feel like all you need to know is his older brother killed four people and is currently sitting on death row. There, there's no intrigue to the case. He admitted, like, it was literally like he did it and he said he did it and that's it. What would you give this docuseries? Uh, two and a half. I would give it two and a half as well. Anything else? Uh, it was produced by the Russo brothers. Apparently that, that's a notable thing. Listen to our podcast. Bye. Thank you.